Hi, uh, my name is Murray Hebert of the CSIS Southeast Asia program, and it's a delight to welcome all of you. Uh, we have a real pr uh, privilege today to have uh, Dr. Saracen, uh, uh, Saracen um, uh, with us. Uh, he is the former Secretary General of ASEAN from 2008 to 2012. He's also been Thailand's Foreign Minister from 1997 to 2001. Uh, he's been a member of parliament uh, and um, in, in the Thai parliament, and actually he's a graduate of Harvard University, but he actually knows a little bit about how Congress works because he was an, what, you were a con congressional fellow or a presidential fellow on that? So he was a pro uh, on the Hill as an intern. So uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Saracen will give a, a short uh, speech, and then we're going to have opportunities for questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you. Saracen. Thank you, Murray. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. With the full force of the Thai team here, I feel like I'm speaking to the Thai parliament. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, let me express my appreciation to CSIS, to you, Murray, and to Professor Hambra for giving me this opportunity to meet with those who are interested in and who are concerned and who are worried about Southeast Asia. I don't think you are worried about Thailand. <clears throat> when, Thai when ASEAN was born on the 8th of August, 1967, there was a telegram from the British office, British uh, Embassy in Bangkok saying that these former colonies have tried many of these architectures of cooperation before, but they have invariably failed. This time, there's some promise. But we, the British, don't have to give them anything as a birthday gift. We have given them the most precious gift of all, the English language. <laughs> I could imagine Ambassador Graham Martin sent a telegram from the wireless road in Bangkok to Washington saying that, watch out, this baby has some future. <laughs> that uh, at some point in the future, our interests, our strategic interests, our network of friends might have to be based on this new architecture. At that time, they didn't use the word architecture, on this young organization being born in Bangkok. Dr. Tanat Koman, who passed away on the 3rd of April, said at the declaration of Bangkok in, on that uh, 8th of August, said, what we do now may be a small step He was anticipating um, uh, uh, Mr. Neil, what's his name? On the moon? Neil Armstrong. <laughs> he said, what we all do now uh, may be small steps, but all these steps will provide future members and even the international community a platform, a place, a stage, a forum to work out their mutual interests here. At the end of last century, Henry Kissinger said, East Asia, as far as innovation, science, technology, and economic growth, vibrancy, he said, East Asia at that time, at the end of last century, about 1975, 1978, he said East Asia is equivalent to 20th century Europe. But as far as the network, the institutions, the processes, and the systems to manage their own affairs, to help manage the fault lines that exist between them and among them, and there are many. He said, East Asia is equivalent to 19th century Europe. 
ASEAN was born, and it just so happened that we had to fill up that gap. We had to take that responsibility of weaving together various groups and various interests through the dialogue network and through various mechanisms and forum and fora that we have established in the past. Now we survived 50 years. August 8, 9, uh, 2016 is going to be our 50th anniversary. We are in a community. The challenges abound. Principle, principle of non-interference and principle of consensus have served ASEAN well in order to manage the diversity, the deep diversity, the wide diversity that we have among us 10 members. Non-interference and consensus. But precisely as we are facing a new wave of challenges, strategic or otherwise, security. ASEAN will have to reflect, ASEAN will have to meditate, ASEAN will have to do some soul searching about these two principles. Because the consensus, in order to undermine ASEAN, you only take one member to say, uh-uh, I am not ready. Nothing can go ahead. Interference, well, it's, it's, it's a cardinal of international system. Since the Congress of Westphalia, you respect sovereignty. But the problem is, integration has brought to us both the goods and the bad things. I describe ASEAN as sharing the strength, covering the weaknesses of each other. And when we are integrated more, we are exposed to each other's weaknesses. So we can't really have it both ways. Now, the challenges in East Asia is we need a set of norms not new norms, but norms that we can sign on in order to say that they are ours. And I have seen the draft, I have seen the attempt, I have seen the, the contents of some of these documents since the declaration of the Code of the Conduct of Parties 2001. And now we are drafting the, con the Code of Conduct itself. The ASEAN way of avoiding issues, of navigating around sensitive issues, are probably no longer adequate. ASEAN was recognized as its glorious moment when ASEAN confronted the issue of Cambodia. The issue then was you cannot accept a country moving arms, army in and change government. I know that you like to change regimes. But the principle that ASEAN together stood up at the UN and made us a group that was recognized as viable, as solid, as effective was the issue of Cambodia. So it's the issue of principle. This time, ASEAN will have to find, and will have to identify, and will have to seize that opportunity. 
that opportunity that ASEAN stands for a principle. And that principle is nothing but peaceful resolution of problems, of conflicts, of dispute. So think about that period. Mr. Lu sitting back there remembers it well. John <laughs> remembers it well. If ASEAN stands on certain principle firmly, ASEAN will be recognized. So this time, the region, as Kissinger described it, full of fault lines. ASEAN happens to be that platform that threatening none, welcoming all. So everybody feels comfortable on the stage, on the forum of ASEAN, as long as our vital interests are not in conflict with ASEAN. So ASEAN could provide a forum. And countries or dialogue partners, big, large, important, adjacent to us, could have problems among themselves and between themselves, but they could feel rather comfortable on the ASEAN platform because the issues are not with ASEAN. Now, there are members of ASEAN who have some conflict, some conflicting claims, some issues with these dialogue partners. And that's when the ASEAN way of trying to get around all these thorny problems by just issuing statements, by just making everybody feel lucky, eat durian, sing karaoke, and play golf, will need to be changed. But the irony is this, and the contradiction is this. ASEAN, since 1967 up until now, have grown, have matured, have been institutionalized because of the towering figures of leadership who did not come through the democratic process. 32 years of Suharto, 23 years of Mahathir, 30 years of Lee Kuan Yew, 7 years of Prem, let me put Thailand into General Prem. Those were people with vision, commitment, perseverance, and definitely leadership definitely leadership, inside and outside on the landscape. The challenge is this, democracy is not going to produce those towering figures for us anymore. Nobody is going to serve, in the Philippines, nobody is going to serve more than six years. In Thailand, last few years, nobody serves more than one year. <laughs> I had to work with five Thai prime ministers when I was at ASEAN for five years. So, we want democracy. We want participation. We want the voice of the people to help steer the region. Another fundamental truth is ASEAN has never been an issue in the election campaigns of any country, those that have elections in ASEAN. So you can't bring the issue, you can't bring the future, you can't bring the vision that Tanat Korman saw 
that Raja Ratnam affirmed that Adam Malik tried to articulate 50 years ago that Tun Razak from Malaysia was trying to explain to the people that ASEAN is our future. 50 years the people on the ground have not had that opportunity to understand, to appreciate and to identify their future and the future of their posterity, of their children, with this thing called ASEAN. So, maybe we are in a bind. Maybe what we want, the ground is not prepared to give. But we have to reflect on many of those issues that if ASEAN is going to move forward in its second half of its age, second half century of its life, it will have to go through many of these fundamental issues. I would call it existentialist challenge for ASEAN. I would call it, so what is ASEAN as an identity? What is ASEAN? as an edifice, what is ASEAN as what Mrs. Clinton called the fulcrum of emerging architectures of cooperation in the region? What is ASEAN? It's an existentialist issue that ASEAN has to ask themselves, that friends, that dialogue partners, that friends like here in Washington will have to help ask. So, my hope is that we are going to celebrate our 50th anniversary not because we reach 50. But like Lincoln said at the Gettysburg, it's a time for reflection of our actions, our sacrifices, and our cooperation in the past that have delivered us to this point. I was at ASEAN for less than three months. I realized I couldn't do much. I wanted to be a general, not just a secretary. <laughs> but I couldn't do much. So what did I do, Murray? I took ASEAN to the world. I took ASEAN to Washington. I took ASEAN to Brussels. I took ASEAN to Tokyo. I took ASEAN to Beijing. I took ASEAN to all the capitals of the dialogue partners. And I have raised hope, I have raised expectation, hoping that the enthusiasm outside would be projected back to Jakarta and to all the capitals of ASEAN. That the world is taking us seriously. We better measure up. I'm sorry if you thought I have misled you. ASEAN will have to measure up. ASEAN will have to fill that void, transmitting it or catapulting it from 19th century Europe to 20th century Asia Pacific, where you have a tremendous interest. I remember Mr. Robert Gates said at the ASEAN plus defense ministers in Hanoi. The U.S., we are a Pacific nation. He paused, and I was waiting, what's the next sentence? He said, we are a resident power. The questions for all of you to ask is, how would that resident power work with the rest all the architectures that we have established together, make them effective. ARF, even APEC, partly because ASEAN success, continuous success. Defense Minister Plus, EAS, how are we going to infuse life 
and efficiency into these institutions that we have created. I will just use one example, then I will stop. All six members of the six-party talk belong to the ASEAN Regional Forum, AIF. I brought North Korea into AIF in the year 2000. So six of the six-party talks were all members of AIF. But for all the problems that the world have had with the Korean Peninsula, the word AIF has never been mentioned once by any party. My hope is there are enough of these architectures, there are enough of these mechanisms, there are enough of these forum and fora. We just together have to make sure that they work and work effectively. I'm dreaming of a day when there would be an AIF envoy on the issue, particular on the Korean Peninsula, based on the assumption that if there is anyone is going to make any concession to anybody, they are not going to make the concession to the US. They are going to make concession to Japan. They are not going to make concession to South Korea. But they might whisper some messages to this roving ARF envoy and ASEAN so that the same message can be shared with all the capitals. Think about that. If you treat ARF and ASEAN mechanism as a child, not mature enough to take this responsibility, that ARF that all of us have together created, will remain a child forever. So let me paraphrase John Dunn, send not to ask for whom the bell tolls. Don't ask how ASEAN could become more effective in its own landscape, East Asia, but how together the dialogue partners can help the mechanisms that we all help to create, that we all, are, we all belong to, how to give them responsibility, help them mature, and help them deliver what they have been established to deliver. And that is a new era of strategic landscape in East Asia percolating in front of us with all the challenges and def definitely with a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. So uh, I, I, I will remain standing. Okay. Murray, yeah, if sure. you don't mind. So yeah. uh, before I open the. Uh, I have the problem jet lag, you know, so okay. I. Have, uh, That's <laughs> great. Um, before I open it up to the floor <coughs> for questions, could I ask you two questions? You're going to do a selfie with your. No, no, no. <laughs> audience. <Sorry. laughs> I'm just joking. So, I, I, uh, I have to report to my wife where I am. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so that I can get the next visa out. <laughs> okay, please. So um, you, you did a marvelous uh, uh, autopsy of sort of the challenges facing ASEAN going forward. And because we're sitting in Washington, uh, one of the dialogue partners, I'd like to ask you, what do you, if, if the next uh, incoming president in January 2017 her, uh, here in Washington asks you what he or she should do about ASEAN? Uh, what would you suggest? Uh, President Obama joined the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, sent an ambassador. How could the U.S. be more uh, engaged with ASEAN? And actually, before I uh, open that, I'd like to ask you a second question. This is about Thailand, U.S. If the next president would ask you what you would suggest, it's clear that, that U.S.-Thai relations have, in the last few years, been hobbling along on probably one leg at the best. What would you suggest that they, uh, the new president ought to consider vis-a-vis -vis Thailand? Thanks. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad I remained standing. <laughs> you know, 
The Obama administration, starting with Mrs. Clinton visiting to the ASEAN Secretariat in February 2009, has been extremely generous and supportive to ASEAN and of ASEAN. I remember the debate in Hanoi, uh, whether to admit or not to admit both Russia and the US. And the debate, the consideration was, but, 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 but every four years, the US president will have to miss our summit because of your elections. I remember the foreign minister of uh, Russia said, you don't have to worry about us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that problem. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is Mr. Obama has never missed our summits. Mr. Putin, Mr. Medvedev has never shown up <laughs> at our summits. So, as far as being present, as far as trying to help the institutionalization of ASEAN, trying to address some of the vexing problems of ASEAN, environment, water, inequity, human resources, health, I think the U.S. has done marvelously. What's next? All of the ASEAN countries are now, except Singapore, at risk of being caught in that trap called MIT. Not MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but middle income trap. Because we have always been a field of investment from outside. Each year, we attract 140 billion U.S. dollars FDI into ASEAN. But the capital came from outside to industrialize, to develop the ASEAN economies. Capital from outside. Technology came from outside. You just move the factories. Management came from outside. In the end, a lot of those products are exported to outside markets. There is no science, there is no technology, there is no innovation on the ground. And there is a Thai phrase saying, you can't borrow somebody else's nose to breathe forever. And that's the challenge for ASEAN. So human resource development, how to manage our own scientists who have come to Oxford, who have come to MIT, who have come to Harvard, who have come to, Stan to Stanford, who have come to all these great universities. But when they went back, the system has not helped them to grow further. If they remain here in your labs, they would excel, a lot of them. But if they go back, we don't have a system to nurture them. They go back and teach science. They teach science to the teachers who will go and teach science. But they don't produce intellectual property. We spend 0.20% of our GDP. Thailand, others are less than that. Only Singapore spent more than anybody else. And that's what Singapore excels in, intellectual property. So I would hope the next administration would pay attention to this. How to help ASEAN avoid that middle income trap ahead of us. I hope that you will understand that ASEAN will, who is going to deliver this to the candidates? <laughs> I, I hope that, you know, ASEAN will be taken seriously and there will be flaws, there will be problems, there will be roles, there will be opportunities that ASEAN should be given and support and be supported in order to play an 
uh, deliver those services and those roles as a regional organization, region wide, legitimate, accepted, and the only one that is uh, covering the entire region for lack of other organizations or other, uh, other, other institutions, other groupings. Okay, <clears throat> human resource development, the, um, the roles that need to be improved upon. And this is also, it will take ASEAN to de deliberate on the central mechanism of ASEAN, which you have been helping. Jakarta, the Secretariat, needs to be improved. And it's not only the budget, not only the personnel, but the space has to be expanded. That the Secretariat must be able to initiate some policies, not everything decided in the capitals. And let me mention what Mrs. Clinton said once again in her farewell call upon us. She said, I came here hoping that you can make decisions, the permanent representatives, and you must try to make decisions so that we can work together. Don't have to wait for communications from the capitals and they are always late. There were three countries, democratic, extremely slow in its deliberation. Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. The rest were quite quick and effective. In fact, one member came to me, has to deposit the, um, what do you call that thing? The ratification letter for the charter. One member came to me, Mr. Secretary General, when do you want it? Meaning I can produce it any time <laughs> because I don't have to go through anything inside. One man decide, you can have it. I said, that would be embarrassing if you would be the first. <laughs> After all, we are for democracy and the principle of human rights. I said, sometime in the middle, I'll let you know when I want it, <laughs> when you can give it to me. So, uh, so the central mechanism of ASEAN has to be given. We need help, we need uh, support, we need coordination, we need um, ex exposures to how things work. I went back to one uh, of the issues I raised, the science technology. It's not that we don't have scientists, but every 25 years we send scientists to study at the best universities in the US, they go back and they teach science. We need to know how you manage the laboratories, the universities, and the industry. We need to know that relationship. We need to know that modem. We need to know that bridge, that transmission line. That's something you can do. And I think you will focus on many of these things. I, th I think the list can go on and on and on. The other one is about Thailand? Yes. Th then you occupied all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have Sorry. to start with the assumption, ladies and gentlemen, that Thailand is the oldest ally of the United States of America in Asia. In July 1883, at Commodore Perry sailed into the Gulf of Tokyo. And the Japanese just close up. We don't want to deal with barbarian Americans. That's not my word, that's in the record. <laughs> the Japanese said, we don't want to deal with them. We close our, 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 our port. Commander Perry had to sail on to Southeast Asia. He sailed into the Chao Phraya River. He sailed into Bangkok. And he got the first treaty of amity between the US and any country in East Asia. 183 years, an ally with mutual sacrifices in the past. And I wouldn't be reluctant to say that that ally is in trouble. And what are you going to do about it? It is going through its own existentialist challenges. 
It used to be that if you appoint a wrong person to be commander in chief of the army, you have a coup. This time, it's much, much deeper than that. And this is true for all the ASEAN members. The vehicle, state vehicle, political vehicle, structure that have delivered us for those who have been colonies from independence up to now, those state structures are in need of reform. I don't want to mention names. They are all in need of reform. Because you have to get to that next level of development. And you are not going to achieve that by patronage. You are not going to achieve that through personal connections. You are not going to achieve that by not the transparency of the rule of law. You are not going to achieve that without competition. And many of us need to be transformed. Thailand is one of them. So the challenges before this ally, oldest in Asia, is just that. It is going through its own self-reflection, trying to find its new balance, and it is different from many times in the past. This one is structural, existentialist. What shape, what form, and what kind of the state structure that would deliver Thailand into the second half or into the second half of the first half of the 21st century. That's what the Thai people are going through. Insecure, uncertain, not sure about the future. And when people are not sure about themselves and the future, how do they behave? They are sensitive. They are extremely sensitive. And that's when friendship, that's when sympathy, that's when understanding would be required. How did we get democracy in Jakarta? Yes, Suharto resigned, but you have to go through Habibi, you have to go through Abdurrahman Wahid, you have to go to Mekawati until you get Yudhoyono. And now you get another president. The transition, the process of restructuring will take time. Go back to my assumption. An old ally, oldest ally, is going through its own self-reflection, very sensitive, expecting a lot of understanding and sympathy. And yet, they feel like they are not understood. People in Bangkok are extremely sensitive. People in Bangkok who read the Bangkok Post and the Nation Review People in Bangkok who got their PhDs from American universities. These are the people who come out and said, you don't understand us. We are going through a tremendous, tumultuous process. If you like the word state building or state restructuring. And we have many problems I don't want to mention. All those problems are converging on this moment. How are we going to manage those things? So sensitivity on the part of friends, sympathy on the part of friends, understanding on the part of friends, encouragement on the part of, part of friends would help ameliorate the situation. And that's not only for Washington. That's for all the friends. Thank you. That's <coughs> actually right. Thank you. So please, Lynn. Please wait for a microphone and then identify yourself, please. Thanks. <coughs> My name is Lynn Kwok, and I'm a fellow Sorry. at Brookings Institution. You yes, mentioned yes. that um, one of the principles that ASEAN must stand for is the peaceful resolution of disputes. Would that be the same thing as um, 
the strong support of international law? And can we expect ASEAN to uh, deliver a joint statement in the wake of uh, the Philippines against China case, um, stating that uh, countries should uh, must comply with uh, the decision? Thank you. I think my reference to the Cambodian conflict is the answer, and that is we need an established set of norms, a recognized process, a legitimate system that would help resolve disputes. I am no longer Secretary General of ASEAN. I am no longer one of the foreign ministers. I am my own self. Nobody give me a script. But I think that's the challenge that ASEAN is facing. Come out reaffirmed a matter of principle. Like we did. Like we soared on global stage on the issue of the invasion of Cambodia. So, in short, I am only hoping that ASEAN will be solid and unified in affirming that we need to support, to agree that the international judicial arbitrary uh, system is something that we have to respect and rely on that would contribute to long-term stability and security in the region. ASEAN needs, or East Asia needs, a set of norms that small countries feel comfortable and secure in that major countries are willing to abide by. That would be an ideal. That would be a good beginning for East Asia going through this tremendous fast pace changes that we are witnessing. Yeah, thank you. Hom, Professor Hom. When I come from George Mason University, I'd like to try Murray to congratulate you on the uh, informative, surprisingly frank, and convincing presentation of the growth and issues of ASEAN. I would like to follow up on the issue of Cambodia, if I may. In Cambodia, you mentioned that Asian stood together on a principle against the projection of power over a small country in Asia. My question, I have two interrelated questions. Number one is, could Asian stood up against Vietnam and Cambodia without the effective support of the US-China coalition? Second question then, is that in this case, with Chinese increasing assertiveness by projecting its forces, to impose its claim on Southeast Asia, South China Sea. Does Asia need that kind of support, that kind of you know, major power support? What is a, that power? And what can Asia do to get the effective support and engagement of that power? Thank you. Uh, all those things are the inner uh, uh, working and mechanisms that ASEAN will have to go through. Um, uh, I think if we, if we can have that solid affirmation of an issue of principle, and ASEAN uh, would, would you know, line up behind that, that affirmation, I think that would give ASEAN a lot of credibility. As I said earlier, the principle of non-interference and the principle of consensus 
have served us well, and they are now, but they are now in need of some fine tuning. We are not working only on the economic integration. We are working also on political and security cooperation, coordination, in order to achieve that semblance of confidence from outside. Because we are not going to grow 6-7% into the future if the landscape is divided. In the words of Mr. Raja Ratnam from Singapore at the founding of ASEAN 49, 50 years ago, he said, what we don't want is balkanization of Southeast Asia. And if we are not solid, we will risk ourselves back to the origin of the purpose of founding this institution, to avoid divisiveness, to avoid balkanization. And ASEAN cannot afford that. Would ASEAN need any particular help? I would say institutional help, systematic help, would be better than individual help. Not unilateral. Make it, and this will have to enter into a dialogue with the ASEAN members, with the ASEAN leaders that you need a system that the dialogue partners together can help you. Not any particular one, when you asked for one earlier, but all of them can come to an agreement and say, we need ASEAN. It's a fulcrum of emerging architectures in the region. It's a platform that everybody feels comfortable. It is relatively effective in bringing people together. We have, by the way, the convening power. We call a meeting, everybody wants to come. Now Europe wants to come to EAS. And Europe has to justify why you want to be at EAS. You have territory on Asia, on the Pacific. You have military presence in the Pacific. Or do you have interest in issues, strong interests, unified, European-wide, one solid position on some of the issues in East Asia? Well, I think if we can produce that system, procedure, and ASEAN has been very good at devising this dialogue partnership. We began with small countries getting together. We are able to bring in larger and bigger countries to be connected with us. Europe, you began with former enemies, big countries, and you bring Luxembourg, you bring Belgium, you bring smaller countries into the Union. ASEAN process is the reverse. And this dialogue partnership together can help ASEAN. And as I said, you can help ASEAN by taking ASEAN seriously. You can help ASEAN by giving ASEAN a role. You can help ASEAN by giving ASEAN the support to play a role that many would doubt that ASEAN can deliver. But if you deal with ASEAN as a mechanism for you to go and articulate your interests and your concern and your hopes and your fears, but not the hopes and the fears and the problems of the region entire. ASEAN is going to be just a forum for airing the grievances, not an effective mechanism to serve anybody interests, including the ASEAN members. So give it a chance, provide it with support, Take it seriously, give it opportunities to play gradual, meaningful roles. It will grow into an adult and an effective mechanism for the region. Yeah. Prashant. 
You know, we're running low on time. Could I maybe take three questions? I saw uh, uh, Hunter and John. Uh, there's another one back there. Maybe we'll take four questions and yes, you answer them fine, at once. Fine. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's see how we do, Bill, okay? <laughs> Keep them Hi. short, please. Please. Yeah, thank Prashant Parmeswaran with uh, the, the Diplomat Magazine. Nice to see you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned uh, the need for ASEAN to do soul searching or fine tuning on the non-interference and consensus principles. Um, and you know, I would agree with that. And you have participated yourself in attempts to try to shape this dialogue and discussion mm -hmm. through various proposals. And others have proposed things as well over, over the decades. I'm wondering if you have any specific proposals for how ASEAN should go about thinking about these issues in terms of how to fine tune these principles. Whether it's, you know, there are various proposals about, you know, minus several countries, mm -hmm. et yeah. cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, thanks. Some of those so, ideas. So yeah, well, okay, 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 okay. Uh, sort of bandwagoning on ASEAN unity. My name is Hunter Marston with the Brookings Institution. Um, I wanted to ask about China's ability to um, pick nations off and sort of drive a wedge in ASEAN. Uh, recently, pulling Brunei, Laos, and Cambodia away from um, the agreement on international resolution of disputes. Um, how do you account for that, and how do you? support ASEAN's ability to stand as a unified uh, institution. Thank you. John? Thank you, doc uh, Dr. Serena. It's always nice to see you. My question, I'm John Brandon with the Asia Foundation. Um, you made passing reference to the uh, ASEAN, the code of conduct that it's trying to achieve in the South China Sea. My question uh, is this. I mean, that's taken over uh, 10 years now. What if ASEAN um, would expand um, that code of conduct to include not just the South China Sea, but all waters in Southeast Asia, and to globalize it and say, have a code of conduct with ASEAN, not just with China, with the United States, with Australia, Japan, all of these countries. Wouldn't that help promote uh, ASEAN as the fulcrum of regional architecture? Uh, all right. <laughs> sir. Uh, Sorry, we're going to do two more, and then that, that's it. Okay. So the, uh, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Millen from the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. Uh, conservation of nature issues have not been uh, high on the agenda for ASEAN in the past, but we noticed that your Interparliamentary Assembly of ASEAN held a workshop on how to fight ivory trafficking last year and that they're planning to do another one next month. And I wonder if you'd like to comment if there, what are the chances that ASEAN will start taking these issues with a higher priority? Thank you, sir. Okay, finally, Bill. Bill, good to see you again. Bill Eichward, business consultant. Um, you may be aware, I'm sure you're aware of the debate about trans-Pacific partnership here in Washington, DC. So, not sure what the outcome of that will be, but the question is this. With the ASEAN economic community just having come into force with three members of ASEAN and several others expressing interest in the TPP, or three are in and several others expressing interest in it, what do you see as the implications either way, if it passes, if it doesn't pass, of TPP uh, coming into force or not coming into force on AEC? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think some of those ideas have been articulated before that, um, you know, if you have problems with having all 10, let us have ASEAN minus. Those who are ready, just go ahead. Uh, so it's ASEAN minus kind of principle. Uh, as we have ASEAN plus, we can always have ASEAN minus. Uh, I think, and that's on the consensus. I think on the issue of non-interference, I think, um, we have to uh, think very, very carefully that um, more and more, and during my time as foreign minister, if you recall, I advanced an idea called, a, princip uh, a concept called flexible engagement. The late Ali Alata said, Surin, I know where you're coming from, I just hate the phrase. <laughs> Sounds like you're trying to flex your muscles. I <laughs> said, but the idea is, there are issues uh, that neighbors feel that they are going to be impacted tomorrow. Very much your internal, very much your domestic, but tomorrow it's going to spill over to me. 
we must be able to identify some of those issues that you know it takes a region to to solve conservation diseases pandemic international uh, crimes trafficking drugs all these things have to be identified as something that we will have to take action as ASEAN. I can use two examples, but it's all at both uh, in economic areas. We had a crisis in 1997. Something good came out of that crisis. It's called the Chiang Mai Initiative. And that is a fund of 120 billion US dollars pledged by all ASEAN, China, Japan, Korea, so that the next country in trouble don't have to come here to Washington to IMF directly. They will have that first line of defense in the region, $120 billion. When I was at the Secretariat, they increased that, they doubled that to $240 billion US dollars. So much so that the G20 pointed to that initiative of ASEAN, that's something that we need for our members, for the regions. But, but that I think my initiative requires that you have an office in Singapore to monitor the macroeconomic performances and management of each member state. By the way, China and Japan divided 60% of that fund between themselves. ASEAN 20, Korea 20, and it took China and Japan over a year to fight over who would give more. And I went around the world and said, you all want that problem. <laughs> <laughs> that your major neighbors are fighting to give you more than the other. They set up an office. It's called a monitoring office. And what is more intrusive? What is more interfering? What is more invasive than having someone watching over you? So we learn to, you know, to open up to each other. The other one is ASEAN itself has a monitoring office at the Secretariat. Not very effective one, but monitoring the performances of each economy. Okay, you reduce tariff, but you have raised non-tariff barriers. Explain that. We feed these things to the ministers. So, we are learning to manage, but I think more than that, there are other issues, other problems, other challenging matters that non-interference will have to be, again, recalibrated. You have to be careful. But I'm speaking without script, without position. Nobody can say, you know, I'm trying to promote anybody's uh, idea. I'm on my own. But I think non-interference somehow has to be. Sovereignty is not absolute anymore, let's put it that way. Because of the world of integration, because of globalization, because of the community that we have established. Okay. Um, um, what's the other one? Um, Brunei. Brunei. Um, yes. Um, well, that's exactly what I think ASEAN has to guard against that you are not going to be divided, you are not going to be um, uh, 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 driven uh, into, into various factions, various, uh, various camps, various columns. Because if you allow that to happen, your attraction is going to be diminished. Because you won't be able to deliver much. Just one, one, okay, let, it, let me put it this way in a negative way. The speed of ASEAN is the speed of the slowest member. Does that sound right? Because you can't go when one standing aside. So you shouldn't open yourself for target of, uh, you know, effort to, to try to sway you one way or the other by anybody, by anybody. ASEAN has to establish itself firmly in the region, earning the respect and delivering on the, on the promise. 
that we are the masters of our own region, 620 million of us. How to get to that point? It's up to ASEAN leaders and up to the dialogue partners who will help ASEAN integrate and mature up into a community. Code of conduct, John, um, it's difficult enough to have ASEAN and China working on the code of conduct. You're now trying to uh, make it universal. But I can tell you this, the elements in the code of conduct are not going to be a new invention of the wheel. They are being practiced everywhere around the world. The beauty of this thing, of this code of conduct, is that it will have our signatures on them. It's regionalized. It is ours. We are willing to abide by them. That's the attraction of the code of conduct. But all the elements are already being practiced in Europe, in America, in the Atlantic, in, in the Indian Oceans, or in the wider Pacific. How do you pass each other? How do you send distress signals? How do you avoid collision? But all these things are there. So it's difficult enough. Indonesia tried, you remember, uh, that you know, we have the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Is that what it's called? Um, uh, and that's universal enough. And that's uh, global. Brazil wants to be a, a dialogue partner. Brazil has to sign on to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Europe had to. U.S. had to before you joined EAS. So that is a fundamental uh, uh, basic uh, document that we already have. I, th I think what will happen is this. If we have a code of conduct and it will be identified that all the elements in the code of conduct are being practiced everywhere anyway. So by abiding by the code of conduct between ASEAN and China, okay, you are actually uh, abiding by the norms that are universal. And let it move from there. Let it roll from there. Okay. Conservation, I think the awareness of uh, um, uh, conservation is, 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 is rising in the region. We are uh, experiencing a tremendous drought now. Heat wave, unprecedented. Uh, and we know that you know, our forests are being cut down. We know that our resources in the sea are, are, are depleting. And we know that our population is growing. We know that the, if the uh, uh, level of the sea is up by Two, uh, two inches, we know that 80% of our population live less than 100 kilometers from the coastlines. We know that many of our capitals will be threatened if, if the ocean rises. So uh, I, I think that awareness is, is coming along. But we have to work at it. We have to make sure that every member state identifies with the regional objective and regional vision. We have to make sure that we can put aside individual particular interests in member states, but committed to something bigger, larger, longer into the future. I have always described ASEAN as being motivated by the vision of the future, rather than being caught in the past full of troubles and rivalries among ourselves. And we must be able to drive that vision. We must be able to enlist our people, 620 million of them, to be excited about that vision. They are not going to be excited about that vision if their daily life is not improved because of the activities, the exchange, the integration, the trade, the investment that are going on, that will be going on, on this landscape of 20 economies. Trade among us is only 25% of the 
of our total trade of 2.7 trillion US dollars, only 25% represent the trade among the ASEAN member states. And a lot of them are between Malaysia and Singapore, Singapore and Indonesia, Thailand across the border with Myanmar, with Laos, with Cambodia. The rest are not trading with each other. That 25% will have to be increased. When you increase that 25%, more people will find their own place in this landscape called the community. But we have to work at it very, very determinedly and with, with a very, very strong commitment what to do. We don't have a Suharto who helped solve problems of the past. We don't have Eli Kuan Yu who helped solidify ASEAN. We don't have Dr. Mahathir. We have new ones who are the products of the democratic processes. And the issue of ASEAN are not their priority. We have a lot of work to do together. I hope Washington understands. I hope capitals of the dialogue partners understand. But we have a long future together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Surin, thank you very much. Um, you know, Dr. Surin spends much, much of his time in the air, and I think all of us have, uh, have recognized again during his articulate description of some of the challenges facing ASEAN, why he is considered one of the most effective spokespeople in Southeast Asia. So please join me again in thanking Dr. Surin for coming.